My name is Matt Schrack. I am one of the simulation product specialists here at CATI, um, certified simulation, SOLIDWORKS simulation expert. Uh, and I am located out of the Denver, Colorado office. Um, so today I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about simulation, how it's leveraged inside of SOLIDWORKS and how we can use that to uh, influence our designs. Um, simulation is becoming more and more popular in the hands of designers and um, non-simulation engineers. So wanted to take a look at how that fits into uh, general product development workflows. So I like to start these off by talking about our simulation products. I know this is a really busy slide, but it's hard to fit everything SOLIDWORKS offers on one slide. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing mostly on the structural simulation, which is sort of the left half of the screen here, if you will. Um, it comes in a few different flavors. Uh, simulation standard over here on the left is very similar to what's offered in the SOLIDWORKS CAD license, the premium level of SOLIDWORKS CAD, um, with the addition of fatigue. Fatigue analysis is sort of the differentiator there. So what I plan on doing during this webinar is to take a product, validate it with you know, these sort of lower level products, and then work our way up the chain to a finalized design um, that we can then release to market as we go up and up in simulation levels. So with any product, um, we want to take a look at kind of how it fits into a whole. So today, we're going to be focusing on a full suspension mountain bike here, in particular, this bracket. So I've made kind of a blocky approximation in concept, uh, in context of the assembly um, that will allow the back part of the mountain bike here to move up and down um, with a shock on the other side and I want to sort of take this and make sure that it fits um, what we need it to do. So in order to do that, we need to set up some design requirements. Uh, as always, safety is paramount. Safety first, right? Uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to validate our existing bracket here for a factor of safety, uh, making sure that it's not going to yield or have any sort of permanent deformation or anything like that with a 300-pound load um, on it. Then we're going to take that and do some fatigue analysis and make sure that it can survive multiple cases of this loading scenario. And then finally, we'll run into some frequency analysis where we compare it to uh, what the resonance of that part is and make sure that it's out of the range of what it could possibly be subjected to. From there, once we make sure that it's safe, we're going to optimize the design, um, make it look sleek, um, make it a little bit more lightweight, as that's ever more important in mountain biking and that type of um, industry. And then finally, we're going to validate that final design, make sure that the rider is both comfortable and, again, safe. So our roadmap looks a little bit something like this. And like I said, we're going to be jumping up the simulation levels as we move through. So let me hop into SOLIDWORKS here, um, and we'll take a look at our uh, mountain bike concept here. So I've got some in context lines, it'll help us with our loading paths and everything that just follow our back suspension bracket here. So we'll go ahead and open up this uh, rocker bracket, as I've named it, and begin a simulation on it. So the way that you do a simulation in SOLIDWORKS, for those of you guys who might not have seen it before, is you simply make sure that the add-in is on. As many products in SOLIDWORKS exist, they're add-ins. So just make sure that that's on, and it'll grant you a simulation tab here which you can then just go and create a new study. So for us, we're just going to start off with a basic static study, which is sort of the entry level simulation included with SOLIDWORKS Premium. Um, notice that I didn't have to export or import any geometry. I still have a split window here with my full CAD feature tree that I can go and change uh, my model and do whatever I need to um, without having to re-export or re-import. So the way that I approach simulations is I just work my way down this simulation tree here. So the first thing is the material definition. Since this is going on a mountain bike, I want to make sure that we're using a, a material that's both lightweight and strong. So we have some aluminum alloys in here that should fit the bill. Uh, in particular, the 70 series aluminum should work pretty well. So simply go ahead and apply that. And now we've got our material definition done. Working our way down the tree, We'll just add a couple of fixtures. Um, these, fixed, these fixed hinges are a great way to restrain a part um, so that it can still rotate around these cylindrical surfaces while still restraining it in space. 
Um, we're going to be analyzing more or less like a worst case scenario. I know that there are some, uh, like there's a shock that mounts over here. So let's say maybe the, the shock is locked out is sort of a worst case or something like that. There are options for elastic supports if you do need those though. So we've got our fixtures done. Finally, we work into our loads on the opposite side here where the back part of the bicycle frame mounts to. And then we're just gonna tell it what direction that force goes in. I've got the line that I mentioned earlier that indicates the loading vector and we'll apply the full 300 pounds as we mentioned before. So just like that, over the course of what, a couple minutes, we were able to take this part and do some design validation on it. So we'll just go ahead and create a mesh and run the study. Should take just a second and we can get real time results on the strength of um, the strength of this body. So our maximum stress here is sitting right at about 40 megapascals. Now that might sound like a lot, um, but we always have to compare these stresses to the yield strength of the material. In our case, the yield strength of the material is over 500 megapascals. So we're well within the range of what this material can handle without yielding. There's a few tools included here that we can use like the ISO clipping, where we can use this to isolate those high stress areas on the model. Looks like most of them occur on edges um, of these sort of tang bodies right here. And we can further this down until they get really, really small. So um, we can assume from this that this product is not going to fail, or at least in its current state, um, due to any sort of stress loading or something like that. Now, just material stress is not the only cause for, uh, for a product failing. In this case, we don't want it moving too much, right? So you can have a product that might be well within its yield stress, but the displacement of it might move too much to, to be comfortable or to be effective for its desired purpose. So we check the displacement plot here and it's sitting at about a quarter of a millimeter. So that's 2.4 to the minus one. So it's gonna be barely even noticeable um, both by feel and to the naked eye. So we can assume that stress is good and that our displacement is good uh, for this part. But we came in here to do a factor of safety check. So we'll go ahead and do that just to, so we know what those values are. For this part, we're gonna use a basic von Mises factor of safety, which we're all familiar with. We just compare it to the stress limit, um, which in our case is the yield strength of our material, right? We wanna make sure we stay far away from that so we don't have any plastic deformation or work hardening or anything like that. And then we can just go ahead and plot it. So uh, this is where people might start to freak out a little bit. Um, in simulation, the old adage is essentially blue is good, red is bad, right? But you always have to pay attention to the scale of your plots here. In this case, my highest factor of safety is over 2000. So if we take this down to something a little bit more manageable, like let's say 20, and then we can re redo our legend here just so it's a little easier to decipher. And just like that, we have a factor of safety plot that looks a lot more manageable. Um, should be no surprise to anybody that it's very similar to the stress plot we looked at, but this gives us the data of what our actual factor of safety values are. The lowest factor of safety or the worst case scenario here is a little over 12. So we're well within that two factor of safety that I had mentioned on my PowerPoint slide. All right, so we've been able to use everything in here. This is all SOLIDWORKS CAD premium level simulation stuff. So any of you with SOLIDWORKS premium, be able to do something very similar to this um, to validate the factor of safety. But let's say that we want to validate, yes, this is loaded once and it's fine, but what if we load it 10,000 times, 100,000 times, a million times? That's where we start jumping into uh, simulation standard level with a fatigue analysis. So we'll go ahead and take a look at that next. Similar to we did before, we'll just create a new study, go down to the fatigue study here, we'll just give it a name, Uh, fatigue studies are interesting because they're really just an extension of your structural study, the one that we've just completed. So the way that it works is we go in here and we add what's called a fatigue event, where we say what we're simulating. So I'm simulating the, uh, the static analysis that we just looked at. 
And I want to take that load and apply it and take it off a million times. And again, as far as a worst case type uh, study, we're going to even fully reverse it, um, which probably wouldn't happen um, so much in real life. But again, we want to make sure that we're really stressing this thing so we know how it performs. So with a million loading and unloading cycles, uh, we have a fatigue event set up for that. The other input you need for fatigue studies is um, what's called an S and N curve. And all this is, is it's a, a, a comparison between the maximum stress in a material and the number of cycles it can endure that stress. This curve is usually um, obtained through uh, empirical studies uh, in a lab. So somebody's sitting there with a fatigue tester and, and testing these materials. But you can input it in here, and just like that, you're ready to go with a fatigue study. So we'll run this study, and notice that it comes up with an error. In most cases, errors are bad, but in this case, in, in the context of a fatigue study, this is actually a really good news for us. So what it's saying is alternating stresses everywhere in our model are below the minimum value on our SNN curve, and this results in no damage. So essentially what this error is telling us is that for the fatigue data that we've entered, um, it's well below all of that. And this equates to what we call the endurance limit of the material, meaning that you can unload this with this load and load it and unload it as many times as you want and the material will never fail. All right, so we'll let it kind of finish up. We'll clear out some of those errors. And you can see the old blue in here indicating a, uh, a good part. So. This is what's called a damage plot. Um, I equate it to like uh, maybe like hit points in a, in a video game or something like that, right? Saying that we've only damaged this part 2.5% um, over the course of a million cycles, right? I think the life plot makes a little bit more sense where it can give you some life prediction. Um, in our case, our S and N curve only goes to 40 million cycles. So what this is saying, because we reached the endurance limit that it can go at least 40 million cycles, probably a lot more than that. And I think that's well within what any um, you know, mountain bike or something like that would be subjected to over the course of a lifetime. So let's go back to our, uh, our roadmap here. And we've started determining if it's safe. Is it safe as is? Yeah, we were able to use uh, linear static analysis included a SolidWorks Premium and some fatigue analysis to make sure that mechanically, this is very sound. We're not gonna have any issues of this breaking due to yielding or fatigue failures. But we haven't taken into account any sort of vibrational characteristics. Any of you who might've been on a mountain bike before know it can be pretty bumpy. So we wanna make sure that this bracket in particular doesn't have resonance characteristics that are within the range of what we might subject it to on the trail. So that's what we'll do next. Jumping back into SOLIDWORKS here, we'll just go in just like we've done before and create a new frequency study. All right, frequency right here. Again, I like to give my studies a name to keep them organized. All right. And here is our uh, frequency uh, study tree here. So SOLIDWORKS is really awesome in that it doesn't make you do the same work twice. Right, so we can grab the part definition, the fixtures, the loads, and even the mesh, and we can transfer it all over to our frequency study here. In which case, now all we have to do is run the frequency analysis. So you can see our fixtures we've created, our uh, loads, and our material definition here. Uh, by default, this frequency analysis is set up to run the first five resonant frequencies, which should be more than enough for what we're looking to accomplish with it. So take just a second to run. There's two things you get out of a frequency study. The first is this plot here. Uh, it's what's called the mode shape plot. Um, it's units aren't all that important. You can kind of ignore those. What's important about these plots is how the model behaves at specific mode shapes. So this is our first mode shape here saying that, all right, this, this tang will kind of move left and right if this frequency was excited. All right, and then the second mode shape is probably just for the other side. Yep, so this is our second mode shape plot here. And we can go through these and, and see what all of the, the modes of this part are. 
um, and how it would behave if those modes were excited. Um, and this is pretty useful, but what we're really after is to know at what frequencies this happens, right? We, we don't want these to happen at all, no matter what the mode shape is. So we can go in and list the resonant frequencies. And you can see here, our first frequencies are in the 900 Hertz range. So we're well outside of whatever uh, frequency constraints that we have. Um, I can't think of any trails where you might run into 900 Hertz worth of vibration. Um, but if, if you guys can ride that, you're a much better mountain biker than I am. So hopping back into our roadmap here, is it safe as is? We finish this off with our frequency constraint saying, that, yeah, we're well outside the range of what I would think you would encounter on um, any typical trail. Um, and through this, we've kind of jumped a few different levels of simulation. We started off with our factor of safety at kind of just the SOLIDWORKS CAD premium, moved up to SIM standard with fatigue analysis, and now frequency analysis is in the simulation professional level. So this giant blocky bracket as is, is safe. All right, we're, we're, we're sure of that. But is it sexy? No. Is it light enough? Probably not. So now we're going to move into the optimization side of things uh, with the topology study. So there's a few ways that we could optimize this in SOLIDWORKS. Um, we could start making cuts in it. We could put pockets in it, you know, start removing material with parametric features. And that's all well and good. But with modern technology, we have a lot more elegant tools to accomplish this type of workflow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to our static analysis we did. I'm just going to copy this over to what's called a topology study. And a topology study is used as sort of a letting simulation take the wheel, is what I call it. It, it, it runs your stress analysis on your part, similar to what we've done, and then it starts removing elements that you don't need out of the mesh until eventually you're left with just what's needed. Right? So in order to accomplish this, we're going to set up some goals. So I want to reduce the mass of this part by, let's say, 50%. Right? The nice thing about the topology study is that you can also build in your other safety requirements to the study itself. So we can go in here and say we still want, no matter what you remove, we still want our first resonant frequency to be greater than 100 hertz. And also, we can go and add a factor of safety constraint as well, saying that we want our maximum stress in this model to be 50% of the, the, the yield strength. So this is building in that factor of safety of two to the topology study. All right. So with that built in, we would be able to run it. But as is, the results would probably look a little funky. Um, because this part is symmetric, we'll want to add in some manufacturing controls to preserve that symmetry. So we can add in some symmetry planes here, going down the middle of the part, to try to keep what's left of this model after um, SOLIDWORKS has optimized it symmetric. Let's say that um, you know that for your manufacturing, whether it's 3D printing or investment casting or whatever you might be doing for this, um, you know that the minimum member thickness you can create is about a quarter of an inch. So we can enter minimum and maximum member thicknesses here so that it's not making a bunch of really stringy bits going through this model. All right, so we'll add that in. Or maybe we're doing some sort of molding right, uh, with a multiple part mold, and we know the direction that it splits. So we can add in mold controls. All of these manufacturing constraints are just used to make your uh, what's remaining out of the topology study look better um, and make it easier to manufacture, right? I've always said that topology studies are a little bit more of an art than a science. They're a little bit different than most simulation studies you might run. So all that's left to do here is just to create the mesh and run it like we've done. Due to the iterative nature of topology studies, this can take a little while. So I'm going to switch to my already completed one here and take a look at what's left. Setup's essentially the same. What you get out of a topology study is what's called a material mass plot. And it looks a little bit different than the simulation plots you might be used to. Um, so we'll wait for these results to load here for just a second. There we go. So instead of having red and blue, it goes from this kind of purple to yellow scale. 
the yellow being must keep and the purple being okay to remove. And then you're left with this slider over here to kind of go in between the values until you get something that looks nice. So I'm gonna to go to the light end here and see what this looks like. So it's gonna go through, kind of do a pass and remove some of these elements out of here. And we could take a look at what this, what's left. So because it's removing elements from the mesh, um, essentially you're left with what's left. So it looks spiky and not very elegant, but it's a good idea of what can be left in the model or what should be left in the model. And you get this information about the percentage of remaining mass. So I even beat my 50% goal here um, by another 10, 15%. So we were able to reduce the mass of this by about 35% to get to this state. Now from here, there's a few things you can do. First, we'll calculate the smooth mesh. So it's gonna take this and knock down all the sharp edges and try to give us something that looks a little bit more elegant, but it's still not something that I would give to a machinist uh, for fear of getting kicked in the head. Um, but this gives you a good stencil and a good design concept to work with. You know what has to remain in the model, right? So we can take this smooth mesh and we can do a few things with it. We can use the simulation display built into SOLIDWORKS and use this as a stencil to make loft features and sweep features to try to recreate this geometry. Um, what I did instead is I actually exported this model to a third-party program that we offer called Altair Inspire. And Altair Inspire is a, um, a PolyNURBS modeling tool in addition to a few other things. Um, it can do casting simulation, it can do topology optimization. But what I used it for was the PolyNURBS modeling. I imported the mesh that we just saw, and I was able to use these kind of push-pull uh, PolyNURBS cages to create this geometry that you see here. Um, I wrote a blog about it. It should be published on our blog site in just a couple days if you're curious about um, that program and how it works and how I got to this state. So keep an eye on our blog for that. Um, but it was really easy to do. It's a neat program that we've recently brought um, to our offerings. So hopping back on our roadmap here, can the design be optimized? Yes, absolutely. We were able to use Simulation Professional, the topology study, we built in our factor of safety constraint and our, our frequency constraints so that we can maintain the safety of our product uh, while minimizing the mass as much as possible and just making it look better, right? Nobody wants to ride something that's blocky like that. So finally, we can move into the final stage of our design. We have this final design concept, looks like it's good to go, but we need to do some more hardcore analysis on it to make sure that it's gonna stand up to the stresses here. So I'm gonna hop back into SOLIDWORKS and we're gonna look at some dynamic analysis. So the setup's essentially the same. We have our hinges here. We have our force over here. The main difference is that we can edit the definition of our force and we now have control over a time parameter. So statics assumes that everything is a static load, right? Once you get into dynamics, you can start giving your loads a uh, a magnitude versus time curve. So essentially what I've set up here is that at time zero, we have 0% of our load on. At time step 0.1, so at 0.1 seconds, we've applied a full 300 pounds on this. By time step 0.3, we've fully reversed that 300 pounds in the opposite direction. And then at uh, 0.4 seconds, we've fully taken the load off. So maybe this is like a really big bump or a really big jump or something like that. We were, we're really cranking the, the, the load forward, fully reversing it off. Um, and we wanna see how the stress propagates and if there's any vibrations that we've excited or anything like that. So there's a few things you have to pay attention to when you're doing dynamics. Uh, the first of which you wanna make sure you have enough resonant frequencies involved. Uh, linear dynamics work on kind of a superposition of resonant frequencies. You wanna make sure that you have enough of those solved. And you also wanna make sure that you have some damping defined. In this case, I put a pretty heavy damping constant at 0.2 on there. I know there's a shock mounted on one side of this, that, that, that spring or sometimes their gas um, is mounted on one side. And that's gonna damp out a lot of the vibrations. But there's also vibrations that are damped out due to the microstructure of the material sort of vibrating and from the fluid, the air around it can um, do some viscous dampening on the material. So 
Uh, most of the time, these ratios can be found through empirical studies or through uh, published articles with similar um, structures. So after you've ran it, you, get, you can get a few things. First of which, we'll take a look at our stress plot here. So you'll never make a stronger part by taking away a material. That's just the way it works, right? But we can make a part that's strong enough. So our maximum stress in this case is about 107 megapascals. So we've jumped up a little over double from our original. Um, that's still far less than our 500 megapascal yield strength. So we're sitting at a, a, a factor of safety of around four-ish, maybe a little over that, right? So we're able to maintain the safety there. Um, we can also take a look at how this stress propagates as a function of time. So I can animate this and we can see the load being applied fully one direction and then fully reversed in the other direction um, over the course of the, the 0.4 seconds of loading. Um, in real life, there'd be some uh, bushings and, and bolts and things like that that would probably prevent some of this outwards movement of this. And we could always add that later with fixtures and things like that. But again, this is a very highly exaggerated plot to the tune of almost 50 times in that that actual displacement is very, very small, I'm sure. In fact, we can go and plat, plot, excuse me, the maximum displacement here and see we're still at about half of a millimeter. So again, you're probably not even gonna notice um, visually this displacement happening. The really neat thing about the dynamics though is that we can leverage uh, SOLIDWORKS sensors. So I'll go ahead and take a look at this sensor here. Um, for those of you not familiar, a sensor in SOLIDWORKS is a way that is used to, used to measure anything in SOLIDWORKS that has a basically a numerical quantity to it. So it's not only for simulation. We're gonna use a sensor here to monitor the, the nodal acceleration in this part. Um, in terms of Gs, that'll be our units and whatever the maximum is over the course of our full loading and unloading. So what this is gonna tell us is if we're exciting any sort of accelerations or if this part is vibrating at all, this'll, this'll show up in the data. So we'll go ahead and do that and we'll graph this sensor here to take a peek at what's going on. So we get some peak accelerations at the times where we're reversing the load, which makes sense. You have, you're pulling something one way and then now you start reversing it the other way, you're gonna have an acceleration peak here. What I'm looking for is peaks and acceleration. And between those peaks, we don't really have much. It seems to taper off pretty well. So. We can assume that this part isn't vibrating. We're not exciting any kind of hidden higher level resonances with the loading that we've applied here. And we can assume that the uh, customer, the end user is gonna be comfortable on this. So to finish up, we were able to use simulation premium, the linear dynamics and simulation premium to really make sure that we did a final safety check, including all of the dynamic effects, including uh, uh, impulse and things like that, and make sure that the rider is gonna be comfortable. So as a full summary, we went from a big blocky design on our, on our mountain bike model here, and we took that design, we did some stress analysis, some fatigue analysis and frequency analysis to make sure that it's safe as is. Then from there, once that was verified, we did a topology study and let the computer kind of give us an insight into what we have to keep and what can, we can remove. And then we can take that either in SOLIDWORKS or a third party program to make it look a lot sleeker, something that's gonna be a little more attractive to the eye. Um, and then we can take that and do our final design verification on it. And over the course of you know, 30 minutes plus the, the solve time, we are able to go from this blocky concept to a finalized design using simulation the entire way. So we can make sure that it, um, is safe.